Hey, watch that! When a plane full of executives develops engine trouble over the Kalahari Desert, put your head between your knees. An enjoyable business trip becomes a journey to hell. Badly injured, the survivors are vulnerable to attack by animals. As two men trek out into the hostile wilderness to find help. This is the lowest I have felt in my life. Time is running out for their injured friends. You have to come to terms with reality. I think we're going to die. Duplessis is executive director of a thriving courier company in South Africa. He lives in Johannesburg with his wife and has two small children. Today he's chartered a private plane to take him and his team on a promotional tour of Botswana. I enjoy flying so I don't often have an opportunity to just relax and enjoy the journey so I was really looking forward to it. Carl's close friend and business partner, Neb Graurak, is originally from Serbia, but now lives in Botswana with his wife. Also traveling are Mike and Lynette Nikolic. They just got married and are hoping to start a family. Lynette is from Botswana, and Mike is from Serbia like his friend Neb. I had experience flying with the small planes, and they always been my concern. But uh, it's a quite a normal day. Nothing, nothing really uh, uh, that you could sense or see that are problems. Lynette's not so sure. I am looking forward to the trip, but I, f I was just feeling a bit uneasy. I thought to myself, Lynette, if you need to say anything, it should be now but I couldn't get myself to express my feelings to anybody. It was all internal. These entrepreneurs are used to the advantages that come with success. Today, their chartered plane is taking them from the capital of Botswana, Gaborone, to the small town of Maun, 600 miles away. It's a two-hour flight, which will take them across the vast expanse of the Kalahari, the desert whose very name means the Great Thirst. Guys, help yourself to some soft drinks in one of those coolers. And where's the uh, champagne, caviar? We're having fun. I'm sitting next to the pilot, and I'm really enjoying the, the flight. And uh, behind me, Ned, Mike, and the Nets just talking. So it was quite a jovial atmosphere. An hour and a half into the flight, Lynette is still uneasy. For some reason, I was becoming claustrophobic. I'm not enjoying my flight. I'm looking out and wondering and looking. Don't worry. Let me take a big plane back, huh? towards one wing, the engine, and I saw a bit of oil coming out of the wing. Costa! What? There's oil coming from the engine. First of all, there were drops, and then it becomes a proper brownish line. Pilot Costa Macandonatus tries to reassure the passengers. It's, uh, it's nothing serious, just uh, sit back, keep your safety belts on. Without oil, the engine will seize up and could catch fire. Costa has no choice. Hey, watch that! Mike. Mike. It's just a precaution, I had to shut off the port engine. The plane should be able to fly on one engine. But in the African heat, the air is thin, 
and with a full passenger load, it begins to lose altitude. We need to make a precautionary landing. Costa radios the control tower to get his coordinates so he can find a landing strip nearby. What are they saying? You can't pick us up on the radar. J just look for a landing strip. There's nothing out here. You've got to keep on flying. I'm losing altitude. I, I can't. Gabaron requesting our position. Their only lifeline is the radio. Gabaron? Gabaron? Damn! Lost radio contact. Costa knows he's going to have to crash land. I took Mike's hand, I took Ned's hand, and I said, God, I'm just asking for a safe passage. All I know that I have maybe a minute or a minute and a half to live, and I'm just worried about my children. I remember elephants uh, running in a panic because of the aeroplane coming. I just saw the earth coming closer and closer and closer. I know that air crashes, you really don't survive. Put your head between your knees now! should have killed them all. I'm still alive. I see my wife, she's burning. The metal's burning me! Help me, Mike! Okay. Okay. When I touch the belt to unbuckle her, I realize it's very hot and I burn myself now. The plane's leaking fuel tanks could explode at any moment. We need to get out of that as quick as possible. Body is kind of state of shock. You try to get up and you just fall down. Guys, where's Nip? We realize, but there is no Nip. There's Nip. It's in the plane. Nip. Nip. It's still in the plane. Let's get it. We are panicking because we don't know how fast the aircraft's going to burn. The survivors are shocked and injured. There's lots of blood around. Uh, my nose was broken. Mike, Costa, and Carl's injuries are superficial. But Neb is in a bad way. The pain was unbearable because, particularly of the ribs. Breathe. And and uh, I actually couldn't breathe. Lift me up, lift me up. Okay, I'll catch you, I'll catch you. I'll catch you. 
Let's take him to the tree. Neb has punctured his lung. He has to prop himself up in order to breathe. I couldn't lie down. I had to stand most of the time. And um, I was hugging the tree. Lynette sustained multiple injuries in the crash. She has damaged her spine. I couldn't move. I couldn't move my legs. As soon as I tried to lift myself up, for some reason I would feel dizzy and then I'll, I'll be forced to lie down. And her left arm has been so badly burned that the nerves have been destroyed. I didn't feel any pain. There was no pain at all. I was just worried about the fact that I, I, I can't get up. I can't do anything. She needs immediate medical attention. Don't worry, they'll come soon. We'll get you to a hospital. The crash has destroyed the radio. But the passengers believe that the plane's emergency transmitter will soon bring rescue. As the afternoon wears on, they begin to have doubts. We're realizing now that it's getting dark, nobody can land. So we're getting used to the idea that we need to spend the night here. Almost everything that might have helped them survive a night in the bush has been destroyed. Anyone got matches? They need to find a way to ward off predators. It is a sample only. It's for promotions. Well, we've got to get the fire going and keep it going all night. Who knows what's crawling out there? I was very concerned about the uh, area where we crashed. When I look at those trees, I was thinking this is a perfect area where a leopard is leaving. It's, it's, it's a very dangerous animal, lots of hyenas. It's lots of elephants, lions. It's a really wild, wild area. Carl manages to start a fire using the last piece of smoldering wreckage. The pilot and the executives prepare themselves for a terrifying night in the bush. They know it's a dangerous time. Lion, leopard and hyena are out hunting on the lookout for weak, vulnerable, or injured prey. I can hear things move around in the forest, and I'm scared. There's a totally alien environment. You can feel the presence. There are they, you know, you don't see them, but you can feel that there is some, something is around you. The only thing that keeps them going through the night is the knowledge that they will be rescued in the morning. Neb is exhausted. He hasn't been able to lie down or sleep all night. Hey, time for the rescue. The fire has done its job. It's protected them from the perils of the night but the heat of the day brings the bush's biggest killer. The morning came and thirst. I, um, I wanted water. It was something I needed desperately. <laughs> the thirst is unbearable. Your mouth is so dry that you can even feel the pain in, 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 in your mouth, in your tongue. They can find no water, so they take advantage of a fleeting source of moisture. Dew. You get a little bit here and there, a couple drops, but it's, it's not enough. In no time, the African sun evaporates their only source of water. All they can hope for now is that rescue will come quickly. We're under the impression that there's an emergency transponder unit in the tail transmitting our position. 
So if people look for you, that they will be able to find us. Back in your plane. Over there. It's not a rescue plane. We look up, it's very high, and it's clear that it's never going to see us. Carl can't understand why the emergency transmitter hasn't brought rescue. If you check if it's transmitting. Emergency transmitters are compulsory in Botswana. You have transponder, right? It's not compulsory. But not in South Africa, where this plane is registered. So now no one knows where we are. We're realizing now that things are not so straightforward as we thought. What is going on? Th th they'll be here soon. Their only hope is that planes will search the flight path and spot the wreckage. But, as the morning drags on, there is still no sign of rescue. I find it very strange that nobody's looking for us. And what goes through my mind is this absolute feeling of, of being stranded, of being just total desolation. Realizing that time is running out for Neb and Lynette, Carl decides he's got to do something. At this stage, I make a decision that I'm going to walk, to go and look for, for assistance. Mike. Yes, sir. I'm gonna walk. Don't be crazy, you'll die. If I walk, we double our chances of rescue, and Lynette and Neb need a doctor. I go with you. No. I'm not injured. I'll go. Be safer with the two of us. Costa has calculated that they've crashed about 150 kilometers south of Maun. So when do we leave? I think the sooner the better. I think it's quite easy to walk five kilometers an hour. If I walk eight hours a day, I can walk uh, 40 kilometers a day. I can walk to Maun in four days. You thought that you are not going to see him again because uh, you are not going to be alive. This is obviously enormously emotional situation. The decision to walk is not an easy decision to make. Will the people that stay that are staying behind will they cope without Costa and I? I'm worried that they don't have water. I'm worrying whether Mike can take care of both his wife and Nib. But it's a decision that I've made, so I decided to just go with my decision. And Costa and I set off. They set out and we said bye-bye to them. I felt very vulnerable again because now um, I felt that I, I couldn't help in any way. I was just lying there, and, and it wasn't my nature to feel helpless. Mike has no idea how long he'll have to cope alone. If I collapsed, then, then things can get really go bad. Mike was my lifeline. It was very frightening because now I felt this is getting very serious. As they trek into the bush, Carl begins to have serious doubts about their position. 
I'm asking Costa all the time, where are we, where are you? Are you sure we, where we are? About 150 k's south of Nana, correct? Keep going due north, and we'll be fine. I have my doubts about this simply from the point of view as to why no planes have come to look for us. I don't believe that uh, he knows where we are. At this stage, Carl has no alternative but to accept Costa's word and walk north. But Carl and Costa are taking a huge risk. They have no experience of bush survival, and if they don't make it, neither will the others. By midday, the temperature at the crash site has risen to over 40 degrees. Mike, Lynette, and Neb have had nothing but dew to drink for over 20 hours. Lynette's condition is deteriorating rapidly, and she's desperate for water. My throat is burning. I don't have energy. I mean, it's like completely dry. In, from my throat right into my tummy, it's dry, and it just needs some sort of moisture, water. Lynette is more thirsty than the others because she's losing moisture through her burnt flesh. Her only chance is that Carl and Costa will bring help soon. But as they continue walking through the bush, it becomes increasingly impenetrable. Walking through the bush is turning out to be extremely difficult. You have thorns sticking into your clothes all the time. But then they stumble across a solution. Costa, over here, quick. It's a track. They found an elephant path. The whole area is crisscrossed by hundreds of these paths, made by elephants treading down the foliage and knocking away the trees. And it should lead them to water. The elephant walks from water hole to water hole week in, week out, year in, year out, decade in, decade out. So it's a proper path. But these paths don't go 100% north. Carl and Costa's need to find water could get them completely lost and bring them face to face with the biggest killer of man in the African bush. Plane crash survivors Carl and Costa have made the risky decision to leave their injured friends behind and trek out into the African wilderness to find help. They've been following elephant paths for hours and are desperate for water. Costa, Costa, look. Right in front of us, next to the path, is a water hole. So this is a really small little muddy water hole. The problem is, the elephants got there first. It smells awful. It tastes awful. It's full of excrement from the elephants, urine from the elephants. It's really foul. The water is a breeding ground for dangerous bacteria. This putrid liquid might give them dysentery, which could be fatal. I'm concerned that it would have harmful effects on my body. And yet, when you're thirsty, it's drinkable. Back at the crash site, Lynette, Neb and Mike are facing a similar dilemma. What came to my mind is to drink urine, so that is the something which will carry us alive. I was worried about kidneys, I was worried about degradating and things like that. There is nothing else we could do. But recycling their urine is a short-term solution. It will soon become poisonous. <laughs> Facing another night in the African bush, their only hope is that Carl and Costa have reached safety and will bring rescue in the morning. We've now walked a whole day and we haven't come across any sign of people. 
we're exhausted. So we take one step out of the elephant path and lay down in, to go to sleep. What they don't realize is that they're blocking the path of a herd of elephants. the elephant decides to warn them off instead of trampling them to death. As night falls, the African bush has another surprise for them. is a welcome relief, but Mike is struggling to collect it. I put various plastic things around just to try to collect some, some water, because obviously that's what we need. But the rain brings with it a terrible worry. It's in danger of putting the fire out, and Mike has no means of relighting it. Without fire, they're vulnerable to attack by predators. I try even to go back to the aeroplane. I put something over the fire from the aeroplane just to protect direct water coming into the fire. It was a, quite a task. Mike manages to save the fire, but before any water can be collected, the rain stops. The survivors are left as thirsty as if the rain had never happened. Being wet and still be very thirsty, it's horrible. Carl and Costa have survived another night in the bush, but Carl is increasingly worried that they're nowhere near to Mao. If we are walking towards Mao, we should be directly under the flight path. Where's the planes? Costa and I discuss why we haven't seen any planes. We're heading the right way. But I just feel that we are, of course, because we haven't come across any sign of people. I didn't see a track of a car. I didn't see a piece of paper. Nothing. This is wilderness. So I feel that we might be way, way away from Mount. Carl's suspicions are correct. Their flight veered way off course and crashed 140 miles east of Maun in uninhabited bush, which is why they have seen no search planes. Although a massive rescue operation has been launched, it's scouring an area over 200 miles away, beneath the Gaborone to Mound flight path. Carl and Costa are walking north to nowhere. And time is running out for the survivors at the crash site. Things are getting worse and worse. Lynette is now getting more seriously sick. Sometimes you, she loses herself for 10, 15 minutes, doesn't know what's happening. And I vaguely remember him raising his voice. He said, we're going to live long, we're going to have children. You know, everything will be fine, we'll be happy. Mike is also struggling to look after Neb, who's had to stand up for three days and nights just to be able to breathe. Mike. Sleep deprivation and chronic dehydration are weakening Neb's grip on reality. Thoughts about snakes, 
hyenas, putting you into panic mode. Neb is panicking, he wants to go now. Mike was trying to advise me not to go. It's too dangerous out there. I will go on my own. I can't leave Lynette. She can't move. Sometimes you have this fix in your brain, you want to do it. Mike thinks he'll never see his friend again, but there's absolutely nothing he can do. <laughs> Neb's condition is causing him to hallucinate. I wanted to find a village with the people who will just pull us and rescue us. You really believe and you really see something what is not there. The moment when you see there is nothing there, that is a big disappointment. Suddenly I hear him shouting, there is a water, come and see this. Obviously after all the stories which we went through and um, uh, I, could, I did not believe him straight away, there is a water. But this time it really is water. We had uh, plenty of Zippo lighters, but uh, we were actually using for the uh, as a promotional material, and that lid of Zippo lighter was very useful to extract that water. Funny enough, more I give them, they need more water. They put lots of pressure on me. They need the water now. Now they're dying. No, I need more. So I said, OK, fine. These few sips are barely enough to see them through the night. But Carl and Costa aren't even that lucky. We're just walking and walking and walking, and we're not finding any water. I'm really, really thirsty, and uh, I'm constantly thinking about how the other people are doing, constantly evaluating whether the decision was the right one to leave them there. And it becomes clear to me that we're going to have to go to sleep that night without having had anything to drink. I woke up in the morning and I was aware that something was irritating my left hand. And I looked and I lifted up a little bit and I saw all these little wiggly things on my hand. And then I realized it was maggots. I tried to clean the maggots out with my fingers, tried to clean the, the wounds because I thought it's a very bad thing, what, what happening. Mike doesn't realize that the maggots are helping to cleanse Lynette's rotting wounds. For him, they're proof that he's powerless against the wildlife of the bush. Even a little bit of control and hope is going away. You start doubting where is the Carl and Costa, why are they not coming? The whole world has forgotten them. After three days of walking in the blistering heat, Carl and Costa have still seen no sign of human habitation, and they're completely disoriented. 
Mentally, this whole thing is starting to take its toll. Shh, 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 shh. I believe I hear a car. But I don't seem to get any closer to where the sound um, emanates from. I realized that it was my imagination. And I just wonder how I got myself into this mess. It's much worse than he thinks. Not only are they hopelessly lost, but because they've been following the elephant paths, their route has zigzagged. They've walked for 60 miles, but in fact, they're still only 20 miles from the crash site. I'm older than Costa, so I think I'm mentally stronger, even if I'm not physically stronger. All my life, I've been taught to be stoic. I realize that Costas and I have only ourselves to extricate ourselves from, from this uh, situation. There's no alternative. You know, I have children, responsibilities uh, that I have to take care of. I can't uh, perish in Botswana, can't do it. But uh, I'm wondering for how long I can actually walk Keep it up like this. For Lynette and Neb, things are going from bad to worse. Mike no longer has the energy to look after them. I sort of fell into depression that afternoon. And I remember even it crossed my mind to go and commit suicide, take my belt or hang myself on the tree because, you know, you, you just wanted to end it. Carl and Costa are now dangerously dehydrated. The most important thing in, in, in the world now is just to have something, something to drink. My lips are dry, my inside of my mouth is dry, and my whole body just cries out for water. At around 12, we, we approach this the water hole. I sort of go across the lip. There's no water. There's just no water. And I think that's when you can just sit down and cry. It was really getting down, uh, and you can't stop there. If I have to walk till the kingdom come, I'll have to walk to find the water. I cannot go without it. Mike, convinced that rescue is never going to come, decides to make preparations for death. I turned down to Lynette and I said, look, things can go really bad. There is nobody coming for us. I think we need to do one or two things which will protect our families and things like that. I think we should write our wills. So we took one of my credit card slips and uh, what you call it, um, eyebrow liner, and then we wrote the, 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 the last villain testimony. We actually initialed our signatures, just some indication that if somebody does find us, we were alive for a good number of days before the animals took us away. After a team of business executives crashed in the African bush, survivors Carl and Costa set off into the wilderness to get help for their injured colleagues. They are now totally lost, exhausted and dehydrated. This was the lowest I have felt in my life. It's totally uncharted territory. I was absolutely despondent. I'm starting to doubt whether I took the right decision to walk. The path reaches the choice either to go left or, or right. Left or right. 
this stage, I don't really think it really matters if we go left or right. What difference does it make? He doesn't realize that this is a life or death decision. Right. At the crash site, Lynette's body is beginning to shut down. I woke up in the morning and I started getting, feeling very, very cold. And I was lying in the sun, thinking now, Lynette, you have to come to, to terms with reality. I could see that she's losing strength in her and the body uh, getting like an old tree. You could feel that he's coming to the end. Neb is also getting worse and worse. <gasps> the pain is now unbearable, awful. We were thinking definitely that we are coming to our end. I think my, my mind and my body was kind of giving up on, on the situation. Carl has also lost hope and no longer trusts his own judgment. As I walk along, I saw a straight line protruding from the trees. I immediately banished it from my brain, as I know there are no perfectly straight lines in nature and I'm, I just don't feel like uh, being disappointed again. I'm sure that I'm imagining it. As I got closer, I see the structure built against the side of the hill. It's a hunting lodge, the only building for over 30 miles in any direction. I see a young girl reading a magazine. I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to frighten you. It's quite a surrealistic experience. My name is Carl de Blissy. We were in a plane accident. Can you please radio for help? Without even asking, I just took a bottle of juice. And while I was drinking, I'm really worried about the people. back at, at the plane, and I, I still don't know if I did the right thing to, to walk, if I shouldn't rather have stayed there. It's now too dark to send out a rescue team. It is a difficult looking at the partner that dying. You just got married and you then you lose your wife like that in the, such a uh, bad accident or, or kind of um, stupid accident, call it. I need to tell you something. Shit, no. you know, I said, I love you very much and I honor you and whatever happens in your life, you know, my blessings and I know that, you know, you will find love again. start seeing the vultures uh, coming around our crash site. I felt that you know they they coming for the for the meal.
helicopter. You know, after five days here, you know, even mosquito for me is uh, like a helicopter. I, 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 you're just hallucinating. Helicopter. Over here. <laughs> We need to make smoke. Put everything on the fire. Although the Botswana Defense Force launched its largest ever rescue mission, the plane had crashed so far off course that they would never have found them in time. One of the soldiers comes to me and look at me like this, and I said, hey man, you're so strong. If Carl had not made the decision to walk, all of them would have died in the African bush. When I saw Nep and Mike and Lynette was alive, it was just... It's just that immense relief that washes over you. Lynette's burns were so severe that she spent a year in hospital and had 14 skin grafts. It was touch and go if she would survive, but she and Mike now have two children. Neb made a full recovery and still lives and works in Botswana. Carl survived to watch his children grow up. The pilot, Costa Marcandonatus, died two years later in an unrelated flying accident. <laughs>